All right, everyone, come on in. Can I get some mic runners possible? Mic runners, anybody? Sue? Oh, no, nope, here you go. We got it, Sue. You're good. Um, red sweater. Yep. Okay. Gotta get this centered right. Okay, well, here we are. We got our open forum and we have a question right from the beginning. Uh, I'll start just one that's been on my mind. The, the cross when we do this. Yes. Is this, is this just a Catholic thing or is it a late, a late from Luther or uh, I've often wondered why. Yeah. It seems like it's why? Catholic. Why we do it? Is it a Catholic thing, and what's the history on that? Um, I guess you could say it is a Catholic thing in the sense of the Western tradition of the Church, but the Orthodox do that as well, the Eastern Church. So um, uh, a lot of Protestant churches stopped encouraging people to do that because of their concern about just outward ritual observances and stuff. Luther, um, in his direction on your prayer before you go to bed and when you wake up, said make the sign of the cross. So Luther had no problems with that. Um, we do it, and we encourage you to do it as a way to um, remember your baptism, place the sign of the cross upon yourself. There's, I think, some, like in my head, in my heart, and th there's... Some people have had some stuff on that. I don't know if that's there. I think one of the differences is some people teach go left to right, and some people teach go right to left. Um, and I forget the reasons behind that. But no, great question. So, um, and maybe some people can add to that. Um, but but it's kind of falls under the same category, Don, from my view, is like ashes on Ash Wednesday. Or, you know, my prior congregation as a very Germans from Russia congregation did not want to look Roman Catholic at all. Uh, and so they did Ash Wednesday, but they didn't do an imposition of ashes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> why? why? You know, uh, they didn't like to share the peace either because they thought that was gregarious, you know, come on, we're in church, you know. <laughs> Oh, anyway, God bless them. They're great, great people. But um, anyway, so, um, but I got them sharing the peace and hugging and, and all kinds of stuff and doing that. So, um, but anyway, so it kind of falls into that. So if it's a, if is it a helpful thing for you? Great. If, if it's not, no. I guess part of the reason I asked the question is I don't remember learning that as a, yeah. early, as a kid. And then yeah. as an adult, I see people doing so it must be because of their traditions. Maybe right. Like, Right, yeah. I think it's partly, as a kid, you probably weren't because, again, we're not Roman Catholic, you know, even though we look like it. <laughs> you know, um, some people call us uh, Catholic light or something, I've heard. Anyway, I don't really like that. But anyway, um, so, so yes, yeah, so it kind of fell, fell out of practice, but I think in the sense about the 70s, it's really the green hymnal. And you'll see that even in there, that it, it gives indications when to do the cross. Right. Um, it, that we're going to be like, we're going to recover even the word Catholic, small c Catholic. We're, we're not, you know, we're not going to shy away from that. Um, so it probably comes out of the liturgical renewal stuff. But yeah, I, I don't think I was taught that much either, Don, in my Missouri Synod. Great question. All right, I love it. I have one pastor. Okay, please. This this was raised by one of the young people at my church. Yes. Right in California. Yes. She said, how come the Bible refers to Jesus raising after three days when it was only a day and a half? Yes. <laughs> uh, perfect question. On the third day. So so it's it's the third day. It's not three 24-hour days. Because, yes, he was crucified on Friday. Now, that's the quick answer. Um, and then actually to throw on to that, um, if you look at a lot of baptismal fonts, uh, you'll see there's eight sides. Like this one in our sanctuary has eight sides. Why is that? Why is it an octagon? 
that's an eight-sided thing, it's an octagon. Okay, good. I'm like, I'm out of my field of expertise here. Uh, but, and that's because the eighth day, the first day of the week, Sunday was the first day in the ancient calendar, so, uh, which was to the god, the sun god, so it, it, sun, that's where that comes from. So Jesus on the first day was raised. So, so that's why. So that's the first answer. Now, if we want to be, if you're, uh, somebody, if you're youth or whoever want to go a little bit deeper, there is some debate about the exact chronology. Because if we go to the Gospel of John, um, John has Jesus being crucified on Passover when that when Passover lambs were being sacrificed, and so that then does give us a more solid three days, I believe. Um, but the synoptics, for the most part, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So even though, and so it wasn't a three twenty-four hour days. But uh, that's is that helpful? That's a great question that they had. And please, Jonathan, since you're here especially, uh, or others, if, if you have, you know, throw on as far as the three yeah. days thing. Two chumps to, to stump. Here, here, here. Yeah, two <laughs> chumps to stump. Did you have anything else on the three days? Two chumps to stump. Um, no, but there was something interesting that happened when we were looking at this passage. I hope I don't here. Um, is uh, in the King James Version, it was, sorry. It was That's, the, no, you're good. It you're was good. the... the eighth day, and the eighth day, if I'm remembering, you can correct me on this, but I'm, I'm remembering some significance of that, that this, you know, there are obviously seven days in a week, but this kind of sense of the eighth day was the day of the Lord, like the, the, the time when God breaks into all time and space, and so it was interesting, and, and again, in the King James Version, I don't know how accurate it is with the, with the original Greek, because I didn't translate this week, but, um, but... Uh, very interesting to have that kind of translation that, that this is Jesus kind of opening almost a, a God's space and time in the midst of our chronological space and time to, to grant this peace and to breathe on them the Holy Spirit. That, and it, in some ways that invites, invited me at the time and invites us to be in that room and in that moment having the Spirit breathe on us as well, which I think is kind of a cool connection to the text this morning. So Chris. Are there some denominations that actually consider Easter on Monday? Um, I believe I know in the, in the, in the Apple or Google John. calendar that it comes up as that Sunday and happen. Monday as Easter. So, yeah, in different calendars. And I don't know if that's a East-West thing. I don't know if the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox have a different day. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know the, the history. I just, I've yeah. seen it over the years. Yeah, that rings some bells to me, too. So there's the, 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 the longer and the shorter answer. Great question. Great question. Marilyn, right here in front. Hold on, Marilyn. Let's, this is good. Let's just keep her rolling here. I'm checking with my resident German expert here. But, um, Easter Monday is considered a legal holiday. It's a holiday. And so it's considered Easter Monday. It's called. So the fact that our staff in our employee manual Monday is a day off for us has got good historical backing. That's good. That's good. I love it. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. Well, there's. That's a good start. Wonderful ones. Kelly, right up here in front. Here, Don. Yeah. Stump the pastor. <laughs> Why don't they call Good Friday good? Who was it good for? Yes. What's it good for? Yeah, who was it good for? Good God, y'all. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think that's such a good question. Did you get that? Um, that I think I want to hear from you guys. What do you? Why do we call it good? Why do we? Uh, Gloria in the back, and then right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think of it as being good for us. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's when Christ died for us and saved us from our sins. Okay, good. Wonderful. Amen, that's what I was going to say. All right, good. Anybody else want to throw on to that one? I, I will say that what comes up in my mind is that It's first bad, horrible Friday, and then Easter 
makes it good. Maybe. I, maybe, I don't think I'm doing heresy to say that. Um, and the reason I say that is because the cross, we don't... I remember one of my systematic folks that I really gravitated to um, said, don't put roses on the cross. Now, you know how we all sometimes do that? We get crosses and we put beautiful roses on them. He says, don't do that. He said, now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that now. But, it, but he, he was concerned that we try... We, take away the offense and the horror of the cross, that this is what God had to do to save humanity, that Jesus died a horrible death on a cross, that it is a, um, you know, an awful thing. Um, but then, again, when we see what turns out to have been happening there, that all of, you know, Jesus who knew no sin became sin um, for us, that 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 was the culmination of his taking of our sin upon himself. And then, you know, on Easter rising from the dead and giving us his righteousness, then it becomes Good Friday. So, so I like it being called Good Friday, but as long as we don't somehow gloss over the, the cross in the sense of it's, you know, like, what's that? Yeah. I was going to say, I'm going to throw up my Catholic roots here. Yeah, so, please. And, 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 um, hold on, Chris, so we can get you... Uh, yeah, please, please. Yeah. Can't hear me. I'm uh, throwing out my Catholic roots here. Yeah. Um, and I think it's in the liturgy. Yeah. That's right. Dying, he destroys death. And then rising, rising yep. he destroys life. life. Right. So that's why it's good that's, Friday. And that's why it's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. We got some more people that want to chime on on that. Yeah, please. Yeah. I, I was just going to ask... Um, my understanding is that the devil recognizes that he's defeated at some point. And was that when Jesus died on the cross or when he rose? Yeah, and that's a good question. And if so is it a is it a good good defeats evil when Jesus yeah. takes this action? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I think you might have been recollecting something I've pointed out in the Passion of the Christ that Mel Gibson did. Um, where it's after Jesus dies that you see Satan crying out in agony because it's like he realizes he's been duped. Is that scriptural? Um, is that... It, you know, it's less scriptural at, than it is church fathers. They would sometimes talk about the cross being like the, the hook and worm that got the fish, you know, um, uh, they would even use this metaphor. I'm not sure it's the greatest metaphor, but but they would they would say that the cross was the ultimate um, uh, defeat of the devil and fooling the devil because the devil thought, oh, this is great, I can get him to come down from the cross. And so in that part, if you think that the people's uh, uh, they're, hey, come down from the cross, save yourself. You know, all of the things that were said, it, the fact that he didn't, that's the defeat of the devil. Because the, if you think about their voices being that of the, the devil, and, and the support for that would be to go back to what when Peter said, don't you ever go to the cross. No way, this I'll never... And Jesus says, what? Get behind me, Satan. So, so those were the devil's words in essence, and so the fact that he didn't come down from the cross and use his power, um, that, that, but no, the Gospels don't say, and the devil, you know, got upset or was at that point, but, um, so, and then also we want to remember to hold the cross and the resurrection as a complete unity, um, so, like Paul will say, Christ, we proclaim Christ crucified, well, he didn't say and risen, but he didn't need to because it was all a part of it. So, so that's that's also why it's a Good Friday. Yeah, please, um, Linda, and then I think um, right up here, Sharon. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just have a question about the cross. When I grew up as a Lutheran, crosses were just crosses. Yes. And then I was a Catholic for a little while, and that was the first time I was exposed to a crucifix with Jesus on the cross, and I now. I have a crucifix with Jesus on the cross hanging at home. Is there a history to that? Yeah. There is a history to that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't want to hawk things here. But, um, so, uh, uh oh. Yeah. What do we got? Oh, it's, 
turns it into amber alert. Yeah. Blue key is spectra. Okay. So um, that's that's the phones. Um, it's not a national emergency, but it's a very important announcement. So um, that you can check that out. So it's a lovely question. So in short, again, this is a part of our problem with not wanting to look Catholic. Um, if you'll notice, our, our processional cross on one side has an empty cross with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other side there's the crucifix. And in our sanctuary, and I guess this was, those of you who go back to when the sanctuary was constructed, um, like Joyce, I guess it was a bit of an issue, but the, the thorn of crowns in the middle of the cross, I think is really important. Um, because it is an empty cross. So Protestants want the empty cross. He's not on the cross anymore. He's raised from the dead. This is not a Lutheran thing, though, necessarily. Um, for instance, I can, if, if I was quick on my computer, I could pull up the, uh, the altar piece that Lucas Cronick, who was the, uh, the artist of the Reformation, very close friends with Luther, um, did all kinds of woodcuts to illustrate the scriptures. And in that piece, Luther is pointing to Christ who's on the cross. But there's a white linen to represent the resurrection. So, you know, seeing Protestants have said, hey, he's not on the cross anymore. What? You know, he's raised, you know, you're, um, dwelling on death. you're dwelling on death or you're, I actually remember a baccalaureate service where we had a Protestant pastor say, if that crucifix is there, I won't participate in the service. Yeah, yeah. Because of what it means to him, but that's not what it means to us. So it doesn't mean that Jesus, and also it emphasizes, probably why it's such a big thing in the Catholic Church, is it emphasizes the sacrificial death of Christ. Um, versus, so now we get to where we get into theology, which is you've got Christus Victor, um, who defeated death, but he also was the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it's both. So having, I think, the, the crown of thorns is a perfect reminder of him being on the cross. Um, in University Lutheran Church, I remember they had this big cross with the crucifix. With, with Christ on the cross. Now, if you wait, the, but again, so each one, so one, it's not, one's not bad, one's not good. It's different things that are emphasized, is what I would say. In my home, Missouri City Church, they had a different kind of Christ on the cross. They had Christus Victor. They had Jesus there, but he's got his crown on and he's triumphing. So that's called a Christus Victor cross. So it's really what's emphasized. Most Protestant churches, like non-denominational churches, will be straight cross, that's it, because they feel like, yeah, they, by what it means to them. So yeah, please. And there are some that have, like, they don't want to cross. There's no crosses, you know, kind of thing. It's out, in a sense, because it's rare, but it, it that does happen with a kind of, sort of a, you know, we don't, it's not only that he's not on it, but he's. It's we don't we don't look at the cross. We don't focus on the cross. We're all about we're we're a resurrection church. I actually yeah. heard that from a place one time, and I was like, wait, but there's no resurrection without without the death. In some ways, our processional cross though does hold that together in in a in a few different ways because we do have the crucifix yeah. on one side, so we're not denying that Jesus died. There he is. But then also the other side is empty. But it's not only empty, but then it also has the gospel: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it has a sense of that in, in the empty and in the in the going out. And in fact, when I processed the cross, I can't remember what day it was. Maybe it was, anyway, I don't, don't remember. But I well, came sorry, up yeah. with it with the crucifix in the front and went out with it with the empty cross on the back. It wasn't Palm Sunday, I don't think. That would have been bad about when it was. But anyway, um, purposely, because then as he's, as he's resurrected, then we're to tell, right? We have the Gospels, we have the story, we have the Word, and out it goes into the world. And so in some ways that processional cross tells that in, a, in maybe a subtle way or not so subtle now. The other thing I would say on Good Friday, if I had to miss all of that, um, but there were really other questions. Good. So. Really good, really good. Uh, back, um, there's, back and then front, I think, right? Back let's there. go, let's go here and okay. then we'll okay. go bop, bop, that way. Yeah. Well, um, 
the messianics that I've uh, run into lately uh. seem to uh, feel that Passover was extremely significant and matched up with what was going on, mm -hmm. starting with Maundy Thursday. And uh, that to me is interesting because then they say that this is all prophesied way in advance, the exact day and hour. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Very much so. Um, yeah, then the, the setting of the Lord's Supper, um, most scholars are going to totally accept that it was Passover. There is some debate about that. But nonetheless, that's a very important context that Jesus gives us this new meal. So beautiful. Back, going back, Ellen, I think, and then Gloria. Yeah. So how did they go from the early Christian church in Acts to Pope and the Vatican and how did they go to that? Hmm. That's an easy question. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Are you, speaking, are you speaking about the kind of the passage we had today of that kind of communal living together and that kind of thing? Is that what you're thinking of? Or? I'm curious, like, where... All the traditions that we have. Yeah. Well, your church history is better than mine, so oh, I'll defer no. to that. But I do want to say, uh, just because you made me think of the of the first reading. Sorry, don't keep going. Yeah, we're all there. Oh, the first yeah. reading today. Um, I want to be on TV, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, no. Um, in our first reading today, there's kind of like everybody's sharing everything in common, and they're caring for the needs, and the, and some people will look at that and say, oh. Well, the Christian church was, was socialist or communist or that kind of thing. And so they focus on the ideology versus what was forming that community. And what's interesting about that is right after our text today, which is very idyllic, is a, is a horrifying story of some people who sold land and then they lied about the land and they dropped dead because of that, right? So, so it isn't the system and the human system that worked. It is the presence of Christ that, and, and really the kind of the growth of the church and the fire that, that grew was, it was so counter to this kind of caste system of religious and cultural, you know, realities of the day. Um, and people that didn't belong together were suddenly in this community together. And it was like, what's happening here? What, what is this all about? And so that's kind of the origin. But how it got to the Pope, you probably have better history than I do. It sounds I, almost I don't. communist. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying is, and some people, some people focus in on that. Yeah. Um, it's not about how they were sharing community. It's about Christ being at the center. And then it shows a story of how that was broken by human, you know, human sin, which didn't disappear uh, when Jesus was raised from the dead. It was still present, very, very present. Um, but it was conquered, but it was still present, right? We yeah. know that. Yeah. But, but that, it wasn't the, the way they were living in that community. It isn't that that system was holier than another system kind of a thing. Our systems always break down. Communism, socialism, yeah. capitalism, but they all break. They all have, have brokenness to them. So it's it's not the system. It's that they were centered in Christ. And again, human sin breaks that almost immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that as far as, Ellen, your question regarding, um, regarding like, where, how did we get to all the traditions and the Pope and the system of authority and this type of thing, um, early, maybe I should do a class on early Christian church history, like the first 300 years or something to Constantine. You'd like that? Okay. I'll work on that on my sabbatical. We'll start that in September. Um, so, um, but in short, the, the, there were bishops we see on the pages of the New Testament. Um, that, that word is mentioned. Um, it, it's actually, it sounds like Episcopal, so, because that's where Episcopal Church gets its name it's really the church of the bishops so episcopal succession or apostolic succession so um so there was a bishop there would be these bishops and the bishop of rome started to become prominent and then the church developed going back to what it says in matthew where jesus says to peter on this rock i will build my church and the church then there's part of the understood that to mean Peter's successors. So Peter was the first bishop of Rome. That was the view. And then let, you know, pass that mantle on to future um, popes. If you go to Rome today and you go, it's interesting that it's St. Paul's 
um, cathedral, uh, you see every pope, a picture of every pope from the very beginning around the, the church. So, um, so a part of so there was a developing system on the pages of the New Testament of authority. There were presbyters, which was a, really a word for pastor and deacons, and that we hear stuff, but we don't have an fortunate. Fortunately or unfortunately, we don't have a, an attorney who wrote the New Testament and said, okay, this is exactly the way it was. Let it be that way forever. We see, we see it happening, but it's obviously because Christian churches are so different in the way they handle this that it wasn't set. But it starts to get set because of going back to John's comma, human sin, and we need to have authority and every system you know and so the church starts to organize itself over many you know number of hundreds of years and to the point where so and then traditions started to be developed and i'm one that feels like those traditions <clears throat> rose up very much from the grassroots more than a bunch of old guys got together in a smoke-filled room saying let's let's have easter on this day and let's have christmas on this day and let's do that that Christians started to practice that, and then, you know, they said, okay, this is the way it's going to be type of thing. Um, so those things develop over time and history. The creeds start coming into play, and so, um, but even there, and like I mentioned a little bit in a couple weeks ago with the, talking about the historicity of the resurrection, we see on the pages of the New Testament now, critical and non-critical scholars alike agree that there are little creeds that Paul brings in or Peter brings in uh, to their letters that were in existence long before Paul writes. Um, the 1 Corinthians 15 is a classic one there. So already, right from that get-go, get so to speak, there were traditions about Jesus that were developing. And so that it, it, so it is a... It's a comp that's a more simplified answer to a very complex question. The last thing I want to say, though, is um, when we get to the Reformation 1,500 years later, well, let's, two, two big markers. Uh, 1,000 AD, the, there was a, a, a bishop in Rome and a bishop in Constantinople. Yeah. Or Constantinople and bishop in Rome, depending on which way you're looking at your map. And fracture. Because there was competition. And even today, you go from Greece to Rome, totally different. And they're right, you know, right there. So, um, and that supposedly was over an addition to the, creed, the Nicene Creed that the West did, but it was probably in reality about the power battle. And now they had a reason. The, the West decided to add, um, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That was not in the original Nicene Creed. It was just the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Didn't have Son. Now, I think Son is correct when you look at the New Testament. But the West did it without asking the East. And the East said, this is an ecumenical creed. You don't get to do that. This is our ecumenical And so the East was right to say, foul, but I think the West was right to add it. But nonetheless, that broke the church in 1000 AD. So that now we got authority issues there. Who's make, calling the shots? Well, you, Luther comes around, and he says something even more radical. That when Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, he wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about what Peter said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Protestants ever after have looked at the Bible as the bottom line, source of authority. So that was a, now the Bible had always existed for those 1,500 years, but the church had always said, one, the average person never read the Bible, didn't know anything about it. The priests knew. They could read it, maybe. But they, it was all about doing the Mass. That was what, and that's something that Luther changed dramatically. But then getting the Bible in people's hands and saying, and that's where Luther said, no, the scriptures are the are more authoritative than church tradition. The Catholic Church of this day does not say that. It's church tradition and scripture. And they would say the church produced scripture. 
so the church can... They absolutely, and it's partly true, that it was the leaders of the church and the, right, the apostles that wrote the Bible, but the Catholic Church says, well, since that's the case, yeah, the Pope can put out this encyclical and say this, and the, you know, and then, then the Catholic Church, and this is, goes back to Erasmus um, with Luther, say that the Bible is not clear enough to be the authority. It's bizarre, it's crazy in places, it's, and you need an interpreter, and that is the Pope, and the tradition, and the, the cardinals, and the bishops, and the priests. And Luther said, no, on the main stuff, it's crystal clear. We don't need an interpreter. And I agree with Luther on that. Now, I agree that the Bible is very difficult in some cases. But on the main stuff, what the gospel is, it's crystal clear. I don't need a, I don't need a famous professor to tell me what it means. I don't need a pastor to tell me what it means. It's right there, clear as day. That's, and so Luther and Erasmus, one of these big debates that happened in the Reformation, Erasmus said, Luther, you're crazy. You know, um, and Luther said, no, I'm not, and it is clear, and, you know, and so that, that was a big marker with all the tradition, but here's the last thing I'll say about Luther that I really love. Just because of that, he didn't throw out all of that tradition that developed. He didn't say that that's all bunk. Lots of reformers did that went way further to the left is what they we typically say, the, the radical reformers. Luther said, no, if it doesn't, if it doesn't contradict the scripture, it's great. Even to the point of artwork, you know, all those beautiful stained glass windows, people were illiterate. That's how they learned the stories. Well, the radical reformers came in and were destroying those because just the Bible, you know, and that even goes back to the cross thing, you know. So anyway, okay, helpful, hopefully. Hopefully helpful, good. And we, like I say, we really need to just do a whole class on the early church. Please. Oh, uh, Gloria, that's right. Gloria and then Linda. Yeah. I wondered who, <clears throat> I grew up saying that Jesus descended into hell. And now we say to the dead. And, and I grew up Christian church, now it's Catholic church. Right. Who made those decisions? Yeah, who did that? Yeah. What authority? Uh, yes, excellent. I don't know. I, I have an answer. I don't know, Jonathan. No, that's you, fine. Go ahead. Um, so um, I do too. I have just enough of what one. That's why I say you probably want to add to whatever I'm going to say. Um, in the LBW, the green LBW, it said descended to hell, but it had an asterisk. Down below, if you look in your green Lutheran book of worship that came out in the 70s, and then the asterisk below said, or descended to the dead. So I'm not an expert on exactly what, but you go back and you find it in both ways in the most ancient manuscripts of the Apostles' Creed. So there's a historical debate about which one. And um, in the newest hymnal that we tend, we pretty much follow, um, but we don't have it in the pews. We have it online and we use some of the liturgies and stuff with lots of changes and we scrutinize stuff, but it changed it back to descended to the, to the dead. So in this case, with our church, it was the people that designed our most latest hymnal and they made that decision. Now we are free to Swap it back and forth, put it back as a congregation. Um, and then the new hymnal, now it says in the asterisk below, or to, to hell. <laughs> so it put the, and the footnote. So um, there's some theological things that I, um, and then biblical things that I, I, there's a big debate on. So real quick, descended to the dead most people believe that statement, which comes in late in the Apostles' Creed as it develops. The Apostles' Creed is based on the old Latin baptismal creed that goes back to the early 2nd century, or um, maybe even 1st century, but 2nd century. Where when someone was baptized, they were asked, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father. Do you believe in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. And then so, so it was done that way. And then over the years, different things were added. 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. And I believe that descended to the dead or to hell was a later, is a little bit later in the development. But um, what I, I think it's based on a passage, an obscure passage in Second Peter where it says that Jesus went and preached to the prisons, the spirits in prison. Now there's one new scholar named Michael Heisner that says it's very clear what that means and then he tells us and I forget what he said. But nonetheless, <laughs> most scholars say, no, this, there's a, well, I don't know what exactly he was talking about. Um, and so that statement comes from that. Now were those spirits in prison in hell or were this, is it just to the dead? You know, I, you know, that's the part of it. So that's a little bit of the background. I, I like Descended to Hell personally. I like the harrowing of hell, that no place didn't get, or that every place got the gospel preached and proclaimed. Um, it could be that that's the Descended to the Dead is a reference to all those people who came before and they, you know, he's, he's getting all those people in as well. Um, I don't know. Jonathan, you want to yeah. add well, on? Yeah, right, like, like uh, the Sheol in the, in the Old Testament, right. the place of the dead, that Jesus is waking those you know, who sleep or that kind of thing. Um, I heard it told to me, and this is, you know, I, I think it was a, a campus pastor or something, but, but was that the dead was a more accurate translation kind of a thing. But I don't think one is more accurate than the other. There are things I like about Descended to Hell. I remember one of the my favorite kind of interactions and talks with, with a confirmation class well before I was in seminary, um, just as a, as a volunteer, was talking about how there's, there's no place where you can go where Christ has not been, and that, and that includes the depths of hell. And sometimes we experience that here in our own, in, our, in life now. Um, I had a professor who said, you don't have to preach hell to people, they already know what it looks like. Um, which I think was wise words. But, uh, but yeah, so that, I, I miss that a little bit in that way. And as far as the Catholic with a small c, the, the thing that is, is hard is sometimes I know people question that and they're like, why are you confessing to, I thought this was a Lutheran church or I thought this was a Protestant church or that kind of thing. I said, well, Catholic with a small c, there's Roman Catholic, capital R, capital C, you know, and the Eastern Orthodox and all that. But um, Catholic with a small c means universal. That's why it was called the Catholic church because it was the church. It was the only church. You know, even after this rift, you kind of had your two choices, the East and the West, but, but it was the Catholic Church. So that, but that's what the capital C with the small c, it means the universal uh, church. And why we don't say Christian as opposed to that, I think Christian is a little more understandable for a lot of people, especially newly coming in. Uh, it gets a little bit into that secret language, which can sometimes be off-putting. But other than that, it, it does mean what it means, which is the universal church, the whole church. Um, so it includes all our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, excellent. Um, all right, no, Linda, right here, right here. Linda was next, yeah, and then we got Joyce oh, and Bill. Okay, just and quickly, um, going back to the born and raised Lutheran, but I was a Catholic for about six Good. years. Or, but if I'd been in a Methodist church, I would have had to have been rebaptized. Which is sad. <laughs> and so in a Lutheran context, Linda, why... What I would have said the exact same thing as the priest, but not because you were baptized by a, pre, a Luther. Uh, I, it's interesting that the priest said that. I bet you that wouldn't be the, the, the standard answer. Um, but the assumption then is what makes baptism, baptism is that the priest who had the hands laid upon them did that baptism. And that's something that Lutherans reject. We say that what makes a sacrament a sacrament is the word of Christ, the command of Christ, the word of Christ put with the water or the bread and wine. We, we have pastors do that in a normative fashion because we want it done according to the scriptures and well done and not chaos and stuff. And so Pastor Jonathan and I hear we've been given the mantle to baptize and to do the Lord's Supper. But um, if you, like I know you were taught in your confirmations probably, if you were with someone and they weren't baptized and they were about ready to die, don't try and find a pastor. Get yeah. You're baptized in the name. If you don't have any water, make some. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if they weren't in that situation, you would say, let's get you into a situation. You know, but so, so that's, we would say the same thing, but for a different reason. It gets right at the view of authority. That's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And, and, throw on real quick. Yeah. And part of that, 
also is that it's a public thing. I mean, it can be done privately, of course, but but <laughs> want to draw that into a, to a public thing. One of my favorite things that we do that wasn't there before that we do have that's new is that uh, the, the congregation makes a commitment. If you're going to the 11 o'clock service, you're going to make a commitment to Nico. Um, you know, I can't remember the exact words. I know that we welcome you in the Lord's family. But anyway, you're going to make that commitment that, yes, we will um, nurture this, this young person in their faith and life. Um, that's an important commitment. Um, I was going to say something about baptism. Oh, so I'm going to stump... The, I say stump the chump, not stump the pastor. You're much nicer. You're much nicer to us than I am to myself. But but we'll stump the chumps out here. What are the three elements of a, that make a sacrament? So Holy Communion and Baptism are a sacrament. Luther debated about marriage because he really held it in high regard. But and confession. And confession. Yeah, right. that was the other one. Right. But what is it that makes a sacrament? What are the three things? I think Pastor Bill said two of them. Maybe you said all three. What do you got? I didn't say that. Well, yeah, but there's no water in Holy Communion, so what makes a sacrament? There's two, so, yeah. Okay, so the elements, earthly elements, yeah. The Word, the promise, promise of God, right? And the, there's one more. Command of Christ. Command of Christ, yeah, it's, right. The Word, is there a promise given? Yeah. And then is there a command, is it commanded by, by Jesus? Christ. So right. he, right. like, for instance, Jesus didn't say, everybody get married. No. You know, I command you to get married. So that's why it's not a sacrament. Right. And there's no earthly element. Yep. So. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. those are the things. That's my wheelhouse with our with our first communion kids as we so cover that sacrament piece. So Love it. Uh, Love it. Good. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, we got a, just Esther, a little bit of time. Esther, okay. Can oh. I have just one second? Yes. My husband had the opportunity to baptize somebody in the hospital once. Yeah. There he was, was working as a lab tech, and this patient was dying. And yeah. he said, are you a believer? And he said, yes. And Jim baptized him. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. cool. Wonderful. Okay. We got a bunch now. It, I don't even know where to go. Okay. We're back, we're back here first. Yeah. Okay. Please, Clyde. Okay. Hi. Uh, yes, I had a question about when Jesus went to the dead or how was he like giving them a second chance if they had to receive the Savior while they were living, like uh, they could do it after they were dead? We don't know. Okay. We don't know what he went and preached to the spirits in prison in the second Peter means um, exactly, in my opinion. Um, but I like to think that the good news was proclaimed. There's a weird, another weird thing that happens in the resurrection of the Gospel of Matthew that other people come out of the tombs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that, but that's... Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting. So I don't know. And just sense of time, let's, let's keep going then. Uh, please? Yeah. Okay. Going back to the Apostles' Creed, yes, uh, I have trouble with the resurrection of the body. So how do you explain that? Yeah. So uh, the only thing I will do again because of time will be to point to 1 Corinthians 15, read that chapter, and Paul says that our body is a seed. Um, we will not, it is not going to be a, riv a revivication of our old corpse. But yet he also says that it's a physical resurrection. It's not a, we're not ghosts floating around. There's a physical, spiritual, physical body. So he can says you, spiritual, yes. Can you visualize? Can I visualize? All these people floating around? Well, but they won't be floating <laughs> around. Yeah. So again, this is what, it is beyond, remember, this is beyond our ability to, to comprehend. But... I would throw on Revelation 21. Behold a, he a new heaven and a new earth. It'll be a big earth because there'll be enough for all these billions of people. But, yeah. but it will not be us floating around on, in the clouds. It's going to be... There's going to be... <laughs> Sorry, I'm stirring my heart. No, there's, there's going to be chickens to take care of. Yeah, and, that's right. And golf courses. And, and wonderful, <laughs> warm, fresh, baked bread just smelling you know uh, but it's going to be fun i mean it's going to i mean it's a, a, a new heaven and a new earth so and, and that's what i would say and you'll be 25 and cats of course return to their origin they'll be in hell the dogs will be in hell. Oh. That's, okay. I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> that's my allergy stocking okay. all creation okay. groans in, in bill is time bill is yes good all good creation. all creation this process 
Christ going to the dead? Is this just continuing and continuing and continuing? And does he go back if he doesn't convince someone that he'll yeah. try again and try again? So, that's Bill, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think Ken wouldn't mind me quoting him, but Ken Robinson, one of our dear uh, re re retired pastors, partly from his own experiences he's had with people, but he hopes that everyone after they die gets another shot at it. Um, I, I, I think the hope, word hope is the definitive word. I don't think you can make that case scripturally. Um, so, so, yeah, um, you know, I, that's where we get into the whole idea of universal salvation and this type of thing. And um, I hope, I, I like what my, one of my favorite systematicians said, Carl Broughton said, you know, we have reason because of what we know about God and Christ to hope that God will get everybody there somehow. But we can't like just say, hey, everybody's going to be saved. You just can't make that case scripturally, I believe. So what we, our, our attitude towards the risen Christ and, the, and about the resurrection is really important in this life. Now, but again, we'll stop short in our tradition and you know, Jonathan has talked a lot about this over the years, that of then saying, well, because of that, this person is for sure not in heaven, they're in hell or whatever. That's where we say, no, we're not going there, that's God's job, but we're going to say, this is how one has the assurance of salvation after death, is to be in Christ. Um, so I don't know that is Jesus still going there all the time and getting more people out? I, I think that would be beyond what we were told. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I could talk about for a long time on the judgment, our, judgment, our human judgment and the judgment seat, you know, whether you're this way or that way. But I think that's a time and space question to a certain extent too. And I also, you know, have, have this kind of sense. And again, it's just, just it's, a, it's a sense we don't know. You know. But uh, when we, in, at, our, at our death, we kind of, move from this chronological linear time into what I would call God's circle time, right? It's a preschool term, right? Remember circle time? But where God's is, is kind of exists in all time and space at once, and that's, that's then where we are, are drawn into. So, so God kind of comes in a different way. I, I think of that with, with people who have these real, and I'll admit, I'm a scientific-minded person, I used to kind of think, oh, well, that's a vision, or that's this, or that's that. When people, someone would die, and people would have a very real sense of them, um, you know. After, and I, and I, what I wonder now is if God has kind of lifted the veil and, and invited us into circle time for a moment to give us hope and assurance that's transcendent of our own reality and understanding. And so, there are things that God is doing, I guess, ultimately that are transcendent of our reality. And, and so, I think of it as this circle time that helps me envision envision that and kind of get it in a way that's tangible. Yeah. There was one more, I think, and we can squeeze it in. Kevin? Yeah. Or was there one in the back? Randy or Val? I think Val was... Okay. Sorry. Go ahead quick, Kev. Yeah, just in Catholic, if they're already baptized, uh, you if you see them on the side of the road, you can do the extra unction. You, so you could right. do the last rites type of thing. Yeah, yeah. just pop the hood on your thumb through the oil and use it. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, anoint them. And again, though, that's really important to say, to. There's reasons why in the Catholic Church that last rites is really important because you need to not go to, out of this life with uh, certain sins not forgiven. Um, and so that's why that becomes very important for them. For us, you're in Christ, you're for, the forgiveness is there. We do have prayers that are similar, but it's not, it's for the assurance of the person and the, the, the loved ones around. It's not for God, but they would, they would see it differently, I think. Okay, Val. I was wondering about the um, Lord's Prayer. Yes. I think the Catholics don't say the end of the like we never yes. say for the the kingdom. Yes. Yep. They do now. Oh, really? Oh. Okay, I, I'm just going to go back real quick, and this will be the last one. So this has been, this has been, we have tackled a lot of great questions. Today. So, um, Val, the, the answer to that is actually a, a manuscript issue. So the Matthew and Luke don't have that. But in the Didache, which is a Christian writing that goes back to like the early hundreds, uh, it does. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Now, I don't know if the ever, but then there's also different versions of the Lord's Prayer that develop, going back to Ellen's question, over tradition that have the two evers. And it was decided 500 years ago that this would be the way you know Lutherans from Catholics. That is why it was added. It was added very early on. It was not in the original manuscripts, however. If you want to do just absolute Matthew Luke, you'd have to do, not include that. But, but again, that's where as Christians we, you know, these things develop over time. Um, we're, we're not opposed to those things. So there you go. That's the answer. And we are over time. Thank you. Next week, we're going to look at New Testament authority in your life and manuscripts. We're going to finish my last three weeks before sabbatical with something I love to talk about. So I hope you like it too. <laughs>